waive it if I don't have any. Well, my name is Professor Robert Green. Right. Um, from the Science Department here at Colgate, and I'm going to be introducing our event today and moderating the debate uh, entitled "The Rules of Engagement: Executive Authority During the War on Terror." I'm standing in for my colleague and friend, Professor Stanley Brubaker, who sends his regrets. He contracted a bad case of laryngitis. He talks like my father. No, and he asked me to substitute for him today. And it's kind of unfortunate because he deserves all the credit for having put this uh, panel together. And of course, he's a professor of constitutional law here. Many of his students are in attendance. And it's very unfortunate that he's not uh, going to be here today. <coughs> anyway, uh, you should all know that today is September the 17th, which is Constitution Day. And that is actually a law passed by Congress three or four years ago under the inspiration of Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia, uh, who um, felt that knowledge of the Constitution by our young people today uh, is perhaps a bit lacking, and therefore he passed what Congress is famous for, an unfunded federal mandate. Meaning all schools receiving money from the federal government are required to put on an event in celebration of the Constitution to learn more about it, but, but we pay for it. Fortunately, here in Colgate, we have uh, institutes and centers um, funded by our generous alumni uh, who help us put on events like this. And uh, today's event is sponsored by the Institute for Politics, Philosophy, and Economics, PPE, it's known as and the Center for Freedom and Western Civilization. The first one is directed by Professor Rubaker, and the second by myself. And it's really a great privilege for us to bring these two guests here to discuss uh, civil liberties of the age and war on terror and executive power. And I would now like to introduce them. And after that, I'll just state briefly our format for today. Uh, on the right here, we have uh, Stephen Wax, who was a Colgate alum from the class of 1970. And he has served uh, as the federal public defender in the District of Oregon for two decades. And he has become famous because in this capacity as <coughs> federal public defender, he defended Brandon Mayfield, who was arrested as a terrorist suspect in the Madrid station bombings after a fingerprint was mistakenly traced back to him, back to him by the FBI. And he also defended Adel Hassan Ahmad, a Sudanese hospital administrator working in Pakistan, who was suspected of involvement with Al-Qaeda and held as an inmate in Guantanamo Bay for five years. Mr. Wax has also written a book about his experience defending these cases of mistaken identity. It's entitled, Kafka Comes to America, Fighting for Justice in the War on Terror. And uh, there will also be a later event this evening at 8 p.m. in Lawrence 105, in which he will be talking specifically about his book. And his book will be on sale uh, by representatives of the Colgate Bookstore. <coughs> Mr. Wax is not only a graduate of Colgate University, he also went to Harvard Law School and was a key part of the Brooklyn, New York District Attorney's Prosecution of David Berkowitz, the infamous son of Sam, if you remember him. Mr. Wax has taught at the Northwestern School of Law of Lewis and Clark College and served as an ethics prosecutor for the Oregon State Bar and lectures around the country. He has received, among other awards, the President's Commendation for the National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys and the Judge Learned Hand Award from the American Jewish Committee. On the other side, we have Glenn Solmacy. He's an associate professor at the United States Coast Guard Academy, where he teaches international criminal and constitutional law. <coughs> professor Solmacy has also taught international law at the United States Naval War College and recently completed a year as a National Security and Human Rights Fellow at the Carr Center at Harvard University where he has completed his book, National Security Courts, Justice in the Age of Terror. 
making the case for a new specialized courts for terrorism. He has also written and lectured widely on national security and constitutional law and is co-editor of the journal International Law Challenges Homeland Security and Combating Terrorism. He's a frequently quoted in major media outlets such as National Public Radio, The New York Times, and The Voice of America. He received his BS in government from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and his JD <coughs> cum laude from the University of Baltimore School of Law and his LLM from Berkeley School of Law, Hall Hall. Uh, uh, uh. So the format for today, as you can see, we, we've set up a debate between uh, two distinguished scholars and professors who will take opposing views on the question of executive power and civil liberties during the age of terror, or the war on terrorism. And uh, the format for today will be uh, a 20-minute opening statement by each professor. Uh, Mr. Wax will begin, and then followed by Mr. Solmacy. And then a 10-minute rebuttal, uh, in which each of them will speak to the other's points. And if they wish, they can then ask two direct questions, one to the other, for a little bit of in-the-face exchange, if they want to go there. If not, then we will open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, so please welcome our guests. Or do you want to speak from there? Or? No, actually, it's actually me. I'm Mr. Sorry, sorry, Glenn is going first. Yes. I, did, I, did I reverse it? Excuse me. Okay. Glenn is going first. Greetings and thanks for having me here at beautiful Colgate University. Um, I think it's one of the few times that uh, Stephen Wax will be to the right of me throughout this conversation. <laughs> he sits there today, ironically. Um, I appreciate the efforts of Pro Professor Brubaker, uh, Kanak, and Leone, as well as, as Chris and the others, and the Center for the many folks involved in putting together this wonderful event on Constitution Day. It's truly my honor to be with you today and to discuss some of these issues with one of your distinguished graduates, Stephen Wax. And truly to be with all of you. It's very, very neat. I'm fortunate also to have my brother-in-law here who um, is a Colgate alum as well, uh, 81, class of 81, and, and we got to spend a little bit of time today walking around your beautiful campus and seeing the golf course and playing around and <laughs> getting to see some of the beautiful uh, sororities and fraternities in the buildings. It's really beautiful. And I kind of came to realize why it took my uh, brother in the back uh, seven years to complete his studies. He's yeah. really good. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, topic of executive power has been and always will be controversial. And it's certainly been so for the past seven years. And I believe it will remain so during the next presidency, regardless of who wins. Thus, it remains quite timely. I do and should emphasize first and foremost you know, that everything I'm saying today is in my individual capacity, not in any way connected or to be construed as part of my governmental or official duties. And I think the same goes for you, Steve, right? Both of us are in our fit there, private capacity. So this topic, as in all topics on the war in Al-Qaeda, requires some baseline before we begin the debate. The views expressed and advocated by both sides come from one or two frameworks, don't they? Either you view this as a law enforcement action, requiring law enforcement mentality in our own court system, or you view it from as a war, some sort of an armed conflict that requires a more of a law of armed conflict analysis, which is different constitutionally. If from a war perspective, the law of armed conflict applies, and if from an LE perspective, clearly, then a law enforcement response would be the most appropriate. Interestingly, and why I believe there is so much ambiguity to this entire conflict, as well as the issue of executive power, is that this truly is a hybrid war, a mixture of both law enforcement and warfare. Thus, both analyses have to be interwoven and makes it more complex, more ambiguous, and more difficult to draw the lines. Thus, we often find ourselves on either side of the debate and we're trying to jam square pegs and round holes the proverbial jamming of the square peg in a round hole, trying to apply strictly a law enforcement response <coughs> or a law of conflict response into something that's not fitting properly. 
However, I will use, and I do believe, this is some sort of an armed conflict. This is a war of some type against Al-Qaeda and like-minded terrorists. I admit it's a new type of a war, but a war nonetheless. Now, executive power, this is an area, in my belief, that is not and should not become a partisan issue. I think Steve and I will both agree, it's not whether you're Republican, Democrat, Green, liberal, conservative, it's an American issue. It's something we should need to look at, and on this day in particular, <coughs> look at it strictly, not from a political lens, but from a purely constitutional lens. As I'll discuss, and hopefully by the end you'll at least consider, and some of you might agree, it's a constitutional issue, and one the founders would agree, even the great Thomas Jefferson, that the foreign affairs power, particularly war fighting, is quintessentially the province of the executive branch. And the war in Al-Qaeda, I assert, makes the need for such rapid decision-making and dispatch as the founders intended the executive to be more important than ever. I do hope at the end we do have this lively discussion and debate and give and take back and forth as well, which I expect we will. The history of executive power in the area of foreign affairs and military operations in particular is abundant with evidence of the founders' intent. Their intent, partially in response to the Articles of Confederation failures, placed the Commander-in-Chief powers clearly in the Constitution to be vested in Article II in the Executive Branch. Now, one way to discern the Founders' intent on foreign affairs is through the lens of what the meaning of executive was and executive power at the time of the framing. The 18th century meaning of the term, executive power clearly included the foreign affairs power as well as the power to execute the laws within the domestic United States. Thus, the founders, aware of the failures of the articles in both foreign affairs, military affairs, and also the execution of laws, sought to remedy these problems with vesting such power in the presidency. Some today strangely look to the pre-revolutionary period and the revolutionary period itself to assert the founders were rejecting the crown and intended, in fact, for the legislature to be the strongest branch, and I anticipate Stephen will assert that. In some areas, this is true, particularly with regard to domestic affairs. However, these critics, such as my good friend Lou Fisher, who's a constitutional law scholar at the Library of Congress, rely upon the strength of the legislatures during this period, during the period of the founding, as in Dicia, the founders wanted the legislature to be co-equal, or in many ways superior to the executive and foreign affairs activities. Simply, they are missing the rationale, and I go back and forth with Lou frequently on this. The legislatures, the Continental Congress, and the state legislatures, for the most part during this period, the Articles period, were functioning as an executive. There was really no executive branch in existence, and thus, clearly prior to the drafting of the Constitution, the executive powers in foreign affairs were vested in the legislature. Since there was no executive, there had to be some organ that was carrying out these functions, and it was the legislatures. Even the great Chief Justice John Marshall later described it. Quote, the Confederation was essentially a league, and Congress was a corps of ambassadors to be recalled at the will of their masters. However, the failures of this framework led the leading thinkers of the day to reject this notion and create an executive branch for the particular areas of commander-in-chief and the one person to conduct the nation's foreign affairs. The Constitution, being enacted, rejected the theories that the US could function efficiently without an executive." End quote. We often look to Alexander Hamilton, and many of you in your studies and your professor's classes look to him for guidance in this area about executive power. He is well known to have sought an aggressive executive branch to meet the needs of foreign affairs, and in particular, during periods of armed conflict or warfare. However, as my colleague out at San Diego State Law School, Michael Ramsey, has noted on several occasions, even the great liberal champion Thomas Jefferson saw the need to have an energetic executive. Quoting from Thomas Jefferson, the Constitution has declared the executive powers shall be vested in the president. The transaction of business with foreign nations is executive altogether. It belongs then to the head of that department, except as to such portions of it are specially submitted to the Senate, end quote. Although not a framer per se, we clearly would not, would not rely on him exclusively as such. He wasn't a framer. He wasn't there as we know. He was overseas. But it is important to note the leading anti-federalists of the period of the newly born United States also agreed with this notion. 
thus helping better argue and articulate the original meaning and the intent of the founders during this period. And it's reasonable to extend the assertion that if Hamilton and Jefferson agreed on this, as many of you know, they didn't agree on anything else, it's reasonable to understand this to be the intent of our founding fathers. The framers also looked long and hard at certain state governments during the Revolutionary period to discern how best to create this unique executive they were trying to develop. But one state in particular that Alexander Hamilton and the others were influenced upon the most and relied upon most significantly during the drafting was your state, the great state of New York. Governor Clinton maintained a strong executive throughout the 1770s and 1780s. It was looked upon as the most stable colony of the era. Of importance to the New York Constitution adopted in 1777 vested the governor with the position of, quote, general and commander-in-chief of all the military and admiral of the navy of the state, end quote. Clinton exercised his unilateral and unitary power by sending the troops to reinforce General Gates' efforts against the British in the Revolution. He only let the legislature know of his actions several weeks and almost months later. The strength of the New York Constitution and government strongly influenced New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Massachusetts when they created their own state constitution. The framers took the New York example to heart when drafting out the federal constitution in Philadelphia. They created an independent, unitary executive empowered with strong war powers, and certainly in the area of foreign affairs. They were also strongly influenced by the enlightened thinkers of their day. Although popular culture, and some of you heard this in high school before coming to college, we've often heard that Locke was the most influential on the founders' thinking, but that's necessarily not true. The most influential, in reality, were Montesquieu and Blackstone, and by far the most widely read and influential political writers in America during America's founding. In fact, Madison said of Blackstone's commentaries, quote, a book in, which is in every man's hand, and of Montesquieu, quote, the oracle who is always cited and consulted on the separation of powers. Both Blackstone and Montesquieu defined the executive powers to include foreign affairs. This area of foreign affairs, and most importantly carrying out warfare operations, was vested in the executive to ensure speed, flexibility, and dispatch. For example, Montesquieu wrote, quote, the executive makes peace or war, sends or receives embassies, establishes the public security, and provides against invasions. In military affairs, Montesquieu argued that the executive should possess exclusive control over the army. He wrote, once an army is established, it ought not to depend immediately upon the legislature, but on the executive power. Again, once an army is established, it ought not to depend upon the legislative, but on the executive power. And this, from the very nature of the thing, its business consisting more of action than of deliberation. Again, the legislature retained the power of the purse, then as it does today, and the ability to terminate the authorization of an army, in our case, the ending of a war, terminate an act of war. In the days of the standing army, this was significant and could be analogized to today's authorizations like the AUMF of 2001, to authorizations today to conduct military operations. Similarly, Blackstone in his commentaries on the laws of England declared the conduct of foreign affairs to be a quintessentially executive function. He defended the Crown's authority in this area by declaring, the king has the sole prerogative in making war and peace. It would indeed be improper that any number of subjects should have the power of binding the supreme magistrate and putting against his will in a state of war. Certainly, of immediate concern for our nation today, as we have two battles raging in both Afghanistan and Iraq. He further declared the king to be the quote-unquote generalissimo, or the first in military command within the kingdom. These offer glimpses into the most influential thinkers of the era and give us a real concept of the thinking of our founders as they debated how to create this unique executive branch. Beyond this, we need to look from a functional perspective, don't we? George Washington, the first president, understood his role, having overseen the entire convention, as many of you know, not saying a word, sitting the entire time not saying anything, listening, absorbing, listening to the debates rage of the day, his comment being at the end of the convention simply to say, gentlemen, I believe we have a constitution. That's all he said, but he listened. And upon taking office, he immediately assumed the duties of commander-in-chief and the leader of foreign affairs. 
Without any statutory authority, he exercised the foreign affairs functions that were not specifically mentioned in the Constitution. Things like control and removal of diplomats, foreign communications, and the formation of foreign policy. These are powers all previously exercised by the Congress during the Articles period. And the new Congress certainly appeared to understand these powers had now shifted to the American presidency. They didn't act. They didn't object. They understood it. There's not a single note found of an objection to President Washington's assumption of these authorities as the commander in chief. Thus, de facto, it appears understood by the new government, the authority for foreign affairs and warfare specifically had become the sole province of the executive. Washington himself did establish this precedent. Now, Alexander Hamilton in the Pacific Essays, dealing with Washington's proclamation of neutrality, noted this was simply part of the traditional executive power over foreign affairs not granted to any other branch of the government it vested in Article II. His arguments are well known as we know, and they carried the day. But it should be made clear these were not isolated proclamations by the real proponent of executive power, Alexander Hamilton. There were others, many other prominent leaders of the time, particularly of the 1790s. Madison, Jay, Ellsworth, Chief Justice Marshall, and President Washington Similarly, described the foreign affairs powers as simply executive in nature. The music going the background. Mm -hmm. Thus, the extreme of foreign affairs, warfare operations were clearly intended to be embodied within the executive branch. Once warfare begins, it appears the need for rapid action supports a shift in the careful balancing act between executive and legislative action. It shifts to the executive. Blackstone, Montesquieu, the Federalist Papers, affirmations by leaders of the day, as well as the conduct of our first president himself, leaves little room to doubt the founders' intentions in this area. Again, this is not to say for a second that Congress has no role whatsoever. That's simply not the case. All of us as constitutional law students understand it. They have the power to declare war. And during combat operations, they have the right to refuse funding these operations. The war in Al-Qaeda, however, is unique, as I've said before. It's with an enemy that does not wear a uniform, provides no institution from which to negotiate with. There's no one to talk to to work out diplomatic measures. And who is doctrine in combat operations not only don't abide by the laws of war, but they flout them as doctrine, as part of their instructions. And spread across 50 nation states, not just one nation to argue, not one nation we're at war against, but citizens of 50 different nations, makes this need for the executive to be, uh, have the authority and importance and power to act quickly, responsively, and aggressively more important than ever. This need for dispatch is more important to war on Al-Qaeda than it had been previously. Also, the grounding in the strength of the executive during conflicts was well before we limited the term of a president to a maximum of eight years. Now, Steve and others in the room might say, gosh, President Bush, King George, he's usurped all these executive powers. But what a great thing we can grab onto is, guess what? On January 20th, many of you in the room, and some are wearing buttons to declare their support, we're going to have a new president. And it may be President Obama or President McCain, but the great thing about our Constitution, through the amendment process, we made sure that no matter what, there can't be an executive who lives or stays in office longer, stays in office longer than eight years. So no matter what happens, the executive will be removed in four to eight years. Thus, any real sense of imperial presidency or the executive power grab or other references to tyrannical government, which sometimes you do hear, and we may hear some of that today, to me is hyperbolic and is partisan. The reality is that we don't have that worry within this great republic we reside in. The president is commander in chief. Whether she is a Democrat, Republican, or a member of the Green Party, the need for quick action in this area requires a unitary response, particularly when fighting a shadowy enemy like Al Qaeda, not the deliverer of bodies like the legislatures opining on what and how to conduct warfare or determining how and when to respond. In speed, flexibility, and dispatch that the executive provides. Now, there are many, and I presume Steve will assert, and some of my colleagues do assert from time to time, that the executive has been excessive 
particularly in the past seven years. But I'd ask, is it really the executive, or is this more really the Congress not fulfilling their role? So look at this from a constitutional perspective and a separation of powers. What has the Congress done to check this authority? If the president has acted beyond the norms or the bounds constitutionally that people believe, what has the Congress done to check that power? We elected a Congress in 2006 dedicated to doing really four huge principles. Alter the authorization for the use of military force. One of the executives, one of President Bush's strongest authorizations was granted to, to him by whom? By the United States Congress. The authorization for the use of military force is a broad, wide-ranging statute that gives the president enormous authority. Who can take that away? The Congress. Have they? No. The Patriot Act. Many of you have read it, debated it, thought about it. Hopefully you've all read it. Who can take away those powers that are claimed to be excessive by the president or the current executive? The Congress. Who gave it to them? The Congress. The terror surveillance program was another thing in 2006. And the FISA reauthorization was something we were going to do. We came into Congress, we were going to change that. What has happened? We actually just validated, including both presidential candidates, Senator McCain and Senator Obama, both voted for it, for the reauthorization. The war in Iraq was supposed to end. It was a real movement by a lot of very, very well-intentioned, patriotic Americans who thought we shouldn't be in Iraq. And the Congress was elected by a large majority or a lot of folks thinking we were going to end the war in Iraq, some way, somehow. In fact, we haven't. We're still there, we're still fighting, we're still engaged in armed conflict. So if we argue and we look at this, nothing's really changed since 2006. Nothing. Now we'll hear people criticize, attack the commander in chief, attack the executive branch, say the executive branch is out of control and it's, we're creating a tyrannical government, fears of what's coming to America in this terrible uh, atmosphere. But the reality is, perhaps we should stop and think for a moment. Who really is to blame for the excesses? Perhaps our angst and anger and concerns need to be addressed to the Congress and their institutional inability to fulfill their constitutional obligations to check the executive branch. Institutionally, they've been effective and in many ways have chosen not to exercise any check on the executive. If Congress doesn't act or fulfill its obligations to check our executive branch. Then I'd ask really Steve and others in the room, but particularly to my colleague, why are you so upset with executive power and why not attacking the legislative branch? Thank you. issue with that. It's also not what I believe the issue that we need to focus on is about. As it was presented to me, the subject of the debate is the extent to which the executive is limited by the Bill of Rights and other constitutional safeguards for personal freedom. That posits the existence of an executive with power, 
To me, the question is, what are the limits on that power? And to what extent has President Bush and his administration pushed those limits and perhaps crossed the line? Now, in our format, in this 20-minute segment, I am to set out my thesis, if you will. And then in the 10-minute segments that follow, Glenn and I get to specifically address, try to rebut those things that our opponent has said. So I'm going to have to bite my tongue and hold back from addressing some of the things that he said that I disagree with and instead present to you my view from the Constitution, from the Federalist Papers, from the history of this country, and the pronouncements of our Supreme Court about the limits on presidential power. I start with this proposition. The answer to the question of whether the fact that we're engaged in a war on terror, the fact that there is an authorization for use of military force passed by Congress in 2001, and another one for the Iraq War, in no manner expands the authority of the President to ignore the Bill of Rights and other constitutional safeguards, whether he is acting in his capacity as executive generally, or whether he is exercising the powers of commander-in-chief, in no manner. Why do I say that? We go back in history. It is the power of the executive to ignore the rule of law in the name of national security, in the name of protecting the nation. That was the very power, the founding fathers, and at that time it was only fathers, of this country sought to prevent from happening in this great republic that they were founding. Their view of history, and I believe they got it right, was that it was executive assertions of the need to act to preserve the nation that had led to tyranny from the earliest moments of recorded history. It was to avoid that abuse which they saw as inherent in our makeup as human beings, that they structured our government in the way in which they did. Dividing power among the three branches. And in dividing power among the three branches, they did not vest the power in any one branch exclusively in any arena. They set up a system of checks and balances within the three branches where each one of the parties would have something to say about that which each other branch was doing. Perhaps even more fundamental than the structure of our government is the language that we find in the preamble to the Constitution. The reminder that all of the power of our government in this country emanates from we, the people. And whatever power Congress has, the President has, or the judiciary has, is power that we ceded to them in the formation of this country through the writing and adoption of the Constitution. So let's get a little bit specific and take a look at some of the provisions of the Constitution and see, are there any limits on the rule of law in the Constitution? And I say you find one. And that one is in the habeas corpus clause. And it's critical to understand the language of the habeas corpus clause. It's critical to understand what habeas corpus is and where it came from. First, the language of the clause. 
Article 1, Section 9. The privilege, privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended. That's mandatory language. Shall not. Unless in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. So there's a check on the rule of law. The writ of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus, the writ that has come to us from England, that originated in Magna Carta, that came to full fruition in England in the 1600s, that has been called by the English ju judges, by the American judges, by legal scholars in both countries for centuries, the single greatest check on executive power and tyranny. Why? Because what it says is that when an executive seeks to imprison a person, on his say so alone, unitary executive, and I'll get back to that, Glenn, in our 10 minute segment. <laughs> when the executive seeks to act on his power alone, the writ of habeas corpus says you can't. The judiciary gets to inquire into the legality of the detention and check your action. And if you've overstepped, the judiciary under the writ of habeas corpus gets to say to you whether you are king or president. You may not. The person must go free. Let's focus for a moment on the preeminent obligation of our executive strong as he may be. And that's found in Article 2, Section 3, where the president is obligated. He shall, again, mandatory language, take care that the laws be faithfully executed. There is no exception for the president's actions as commander-in-chief or otherwise. In all respects, in all areas in which he acts, he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That's his job. Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution. And Article 2, Section 2. There are no limits on the President's obligation to faithfully execute the laws. It is said... In Article 2, the President shall be Commander-in-Chief. It does not say that as such he may ignore what came before and ignore the law. Nor does the role of Commander-in-Chief independently give him any authority that is not otherwise set out in the Constitution. With respect to the war power, in the Federalist Papers, in the discussions about the founding of this country. Hamilton, strong executive. He believes in a strong executive. But Hamilton says, the history of human conduct does not warrant that exalted opinion of human virtue, which would make it wise in a nation to commit interests so delicate and momentous a kind to the sole disposal of a President of the United States. In Federalist 69, Hamilton discussed the English way of making war and carrying out war. He discussed the powers that the English gave to their monarch. And he said, we need to understand that the monarch in England has the authority to declare war, to raise the army, to execute the war, and to determine how that is going to happen. Hamilton reminded us that in this country, the war power is split. Hamilton reminded us that Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress, not the President, not only to declare war, to raise and support armies, but also to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. 
to make rules for the government of those forces. That's Congress authority. That is not the president's as commander in chief. Madison in Federalist 47 said, when the legislative and executive powers are united in the same person or body, there can be no liberty, because apprehensions may arise lest the same monarch or senate should enact tyrannical laws to execute them in a tyrannical power. Were the power of judging joined to the executive power, the judge might behave with all the violence of an oppressor. Now, let's get to the modern age. Let's get to that which has motivated me in the last seven years of my work representing people accused in the war on terror. Some have been convicted in federal courts. Some have been found to have been mistakenly accused. Some have been held in the lawlessness of Guantanamo. Seven clients my office and I have represented there. Three are still there, four are now at home. Those Guantanamo cases have generated three decisions by our Supreme Court. And in each of the three cases, the President of the United States, through the Solicitor General and his deputy, went into the Supreme Court and argued that the President had the power acting alone, on his say-so alone, to seize and detain people indefinitely. For the first two years that the men were in Guantanamo, there was no process, none, civilian or military. The president said, we don't need one. I, as commander in chief, he said, can do this. Because I said, these men are the worst of the worst, all picked up on the battlefield, things of that nature. And they said that with respect to aliens, and they said it with respect to citizens of this great country. And they said it with respect to citizens who were picked up in Afghanistan, and citizens who were picked up in the United States. In the first two decisions in which the Supreme Court rejected the arguments of the Bush administration, in the first two decisions in which the Supreme Court said, you may not act on your own, they relied on statute. They first said, the habeas corpus statute gives us the obligation and does not give you the authority to act in the way in which you're acting, sir. And to be sure, there is plenty of blame to go around. The Congress sitting on its hands, the Congress acquiescing, the Congress being bullied, the Republican Congress until 2006, the President's Congress doing the President's bidding passed two statutes to legislatively strip habeas corpus authority. And in June of this year, the Supreme Court said for the third time, no, Mr. President, you may not do this. And in the decisions, you find, I believe, the statements about our constitutional structure that make clear that the president is and must be under the law. <coughs> In the Boumediene case decided this past June, Justice Kennedy, and I have to note with a degree of amusement, he's a conservative. He was appointed by President Reagan. And in most of his decisions, he is not anything that anyone who deals with the law would call a wild-eyed liberal or a believer in, any, believer in anything other than a very narrow view of judicial power. Justice Kennedy said, Security subsists, too, in fidelity to freedom's first principles. This tension between security and freedom, is this a war, is this military, it doesn't matter what you call it. Because security, our security, subsists in our belief in our first principle, principles. And chief among them, he said, are freedom from arbitrary and unlawful restraint. And the personal liberty that is secured by adherence to the separation of powers. What are those first principles? Justice O'Connor, another President Reagan Republican appointee, says in the Hamdi decision, 
U.S. Citizen case, 2004. We have long since made clear that a state of war is not a blank check for the president when it comes to the rights of the nation's citizens. In Boumediene, Justice Kennedy said, this history was known to the framers. Talking about the English history, it no doubt confirmed their view that pendular swings to and away from individual liberty were endemic to undivided, uncontrolled power. The framers' inherent distrust of governmental power was the driving force behind the constitutional plan that allocated powers among three independent branches. This design serves not only to make government accountable, but also to secure individual liberty. The history that Justice Kennedy was referring to in the Boumediene decision is a history that he spelled out in detail. When I first read the opinion, I was somewhat surprised to see how he structured the argument. And the more I thought about it, the more and it made sense to me how important it was for him to go back 800 years to give all Americans who bother to read Supreme Court opinions, not too many, hopefully some of you, <laughs> a history lesson in our constitutional structure. A history lesson about tyranny, about security and freedom. Justice Kennedy says, let's go back to running me. I love it when people go back to running me. I have the image of this field this little English town, the knights on their horses all dressed in their armor, King John getting dressed down, the barons saying to him, Johnny boy, you know, you may be the king, but we barons speaking on our own behalf, probably not on behalf of their subjects, we don't like what you're doing to us, and we're going to rein you in, John. And here's Magna Carta, the great charter, and the great charter setting out rights that we barons and our people have that you can't take away from us. And in Magna Carta was a clause, one of the chapters that eventually becomes the writ of habeas corpus. We can fast forward 400 years from 1215 to the 1600s. This is Justice Kennedy speaking. This is not a federal public defender speaking. I'm just channeling Justice Kennedy. He says, in the 1620s, there was King Charles I. He was fighting an unpopular war. I'll add my aside, as President Bush is today, at least unpopular with some people in this country. And King Charles needed to levy some taxes to fight that war. And he didn't go through the normal process. He said to a bunch of his knights, the barons of the time, pay up. Five of the knights refused. He said, oh yeah? And he threw them in the tower. The knight said, wait a minute, Charles, you can't do this to us. So they petitioned for habeas corpus in 1627. And there was a tussle between Charles and the judiciary over these knights. The parliament got in the act because the English jurists were not immediately keen on making a decision on the fundamental issue. They stopped in a discussion about bail. Judges sometimes try to decide cases without reaching the fundamental issue so they don't lose their jobs or their kids back in those days. So Parliament gets in. The Petition of Right of 1628, Parliament says, Charles, you can't do this. You may not unilaterally throw people in the tower. The English judges have under the writ of habeas corpus the right to review your infringement on liberty. Charles wasn't amused, he dismissed Parliament. 1640, Parliament comes back into power and it passes a habeas corpus act. Charles isn't amused. He dismisses Parliament. Charles loses his head. Cromwell fights civil war in England. 1679, they finally pass the habeas corpus act. And what President Bush argued for 
in Rasul, Hamdi, Padilla, Hamdan, and Boumediene, the three cases in which the Supreme Court said no, was a power to act unilaterally to put people in prison, the island in Guantanamo, as isolated as any place can be, on his own say-so, with no process. A power that the English kings had taken from them 400 years ago, and that the Supreme Court reminded President Bush he does not have today. Freedom lives. stop and look. Uh, one, first and foremost, we said, you know, gosh, uh, Steve, uh, Mr. Wax, Attorney Wax is talking about Justice Kennedy, and God, we know he's, he's a Republican appointee, and gosh, guys, stop. This is the law. It's apolitical. It shouldn't matter who appointed it. Should it? Of course not. Justice Souter was appointed by President H.W. Bush. He's one of the more liberal members of the Lincoln's construction of the law. The law is not politics. The law is not partisan. The law is pure. So just first and foremost, when you're studying law, remove yourselves from that. Think about who's been appointed and who's appointed certain folks to the court. We don't want it to be a partisan. Certainly there's some influence. I'm not naive enough to say, oh gosh, they're all going to be a certain way. And certainly you would say that there are certain conservative members of the court and certain liberal members that are very much of that ilk. But I don't think any of them are acting in a partisan fashion. Just a thought. Now, what we got to at the outset of my talk was really, when we look at any of the debates about the war on Al-Qaeda, the war on terror, whatever we want to call it. And I refer to it as the war on Al-Qaeda because one of the items that I'm concerned about is executive power. Because if we call it the war on terror, or the war on terrorism, it is never ending. Even if we have the executive being done, it keeps going. We still have a never-ending war. There's no fina finality. There's no chance to declare victory. As distinct, well, if we have an entity or some sort of a, uh, an entity that we can actually declare war against and actually can defeat. So I use al-Qaeda knowing that it's a very limited term, not certainly almost the opposite, right? Saying the broad term of terror to the very limited term of al-Qaeda to limit this authority. But it goes to what I said initially. Do you view this as an armed conflict or a law enforcement action. And listening to Mr. Wax, who eloquently stated his position, would say he clearly thinks it's a law enforcement action. He clearly views this as being not really a war. We're overblowing this. This is all hyperbole. These folks are people we need to use the federal court system for. It's certainly the right way to proceed. He views it in that capacity, because especially when he's arguing the Boumidien issue, when you're talking about habeas corpus, when you're talking about these types of avenues, during a time of armed conflict, it's different. And you say habeas corpus is a constitutional right for whom? For American citizens and those that reside in the United States. In a period of war, and we capture, God forbid we are fighting China, and we're in an armed conflict against China, and we capture Chinese soldiers, where do they go to? Do we give them habeas corpus rights to come up and sit before our federal courts? Of course not. What do we do with them? The Geneva Conventions apply, and we now have what? Prisoner of war status. They stay till the end of hostilities, till the cessation of hostilities. We have something in place. And if you're looking at it from a hybrid, you can understand why this is confusing. But the traditional notion of habeas corpus is different in a war. It has to be. Otherwise, the Geneva Conventions are absolutely pointless. And the Boumidien decision, if you look closely at it, if you do read it or look at it in class, what it really did, yes, it gave a wonderful, eloquent story. Justice Kennedy wrote a beautiful story of the history. It was, it's good to read. What dangerous side of it is that we now gave folks that are non-citizens, not inside the United States, access to our federal courts and the same protections you have 
as a U.S. citizen. So as a member of the armed force of the United States, or an armed force member of China, or Iran, or the nation state, the Al-Qaeda member now has more rights than would a prisoner of war in traditional armed conflict. I'd suggest that went a little too far, folks. Let's think about it. Prisoner of war in a legitimate armed conflict that the Geneva Conventions apply would never have access to our courts to challenge his or her imprisonment in a prisoner of war camp. The Supreme Court now has said, well, we think this is bad, and, and I guess I have to be careful because it, you all should know I'm very concerned about Guantanamo as well. Most of my book is based on closing Guantanamo because it is wrong. Things are not going the way they intended. But I do think we have to look at how we best deal with this habeas issue so that we don't trigger that because I think the precedent for applying other constitutional protections to Al-Qaeda Al type warriors in our federal courts, the opportunity for that and the chance for that is quite significant and dangerous. Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, right? We're going to have soldiers concerned, potentially, from Boumediene about before raiding a safe house in Yemen to make sure they have a Fourth Amendment warrant because what? Any information, maybe that laptop they find or seize could never be introduced in the court because a great federal public defender like one sitting here will challenge it and it'll never be introduced in evidence and they'll be acquitted. So we have to be careful about how far we go with this, with this debate, but it goes back to that fundamental issue that I started the discussion with, is whether it's a law enforcement action or a war. And if you look at it, again, Steve's looking at it really, I think, from a law enforcement perspective. I'm looking at it from a war, but I said to you, it's not really our traditional war. We have to find another way to provide this, because it is part of the US tradition. It is part of who we are. It's part of what our belief system is, is to grant people that right to challenge their it's not a Geneva Convention war. So what do we do, Glenn? So if we do have a special court system that would have a habeas right for a specialized judge, not the traditional civilian court system, but a specialized terrorist court, to provide a civilian judge to hear habeas petitions within the United States, well, gosh, maybe we're getting what? We have the hybrid warrior, an al-Qaeda member who's a mix of warrior and an <coughs> international criminal. He or she is going to in a hybrid war, which we said is, really, let's face it, it's more law enforcement and warfare. It's really that unique mix. So we have a hybrid warrior and a hybrid war. Isn't it logical to think the right way to prosecute these people and afford some of what Steve's noble assertions could be best accomplished by without hurting our own justice system or damaging international order or disregarding the Geneva Conventions by creating a special hybrid court? A court system like we have, special courts for bankruptcy, like we have special courts for immigration, why not consider, why not have the Congress consider hold hearings, which some have started to do, on having special terrorism courts to satisfy some of these needs that Steve's raised. I would also uh, raise the issue once again, I think, and it's important to look, when we went through the history of what's taken place and we're talking about what Congress has done and we're talking about excessive use of the executive branch or executive powers during this conflict of some sort. What really is Congress doing? We can say that Republican Congress is wrong. I'll, I'll give that to you. You're 100% right. They allowed the president to proceed without any check. But no longer was the case as of 2006. The easy way to limit the executive power is to limit the authorization for the use of military force. Now, for some to say they were bullied, do you really think that Speaker Pelosi feels like she's being bullied by President Bush? I think not. I think there's real political realities, aren't there? If the Congress went ahead and fulfilled its obligation to limit the extent of the powers in the authorization for the use of military force, which allow the President to conduct this war on terror, sweeping authorities, sweeping domestic authorities for the USA Patriot Act, fighting the war in Iraq, the Congress could do what? Limit each of those statutes, revisit them, or what? Cut funding for the war in Iraq. Could limit funding. Could push the president to consider the timetable issue, right? These are all things we spoke about that even Alexander Hamilton said there's a role for Congress. There certainly is. So they have those opportunities. But I think the Congress has, once again, not met its obligations. So when we stop and we talk and we 
review what's taking place and what the Supreme Court has said in Rasul and Hamdi and Hamdan, what really interestingly, what happened again? In Hamdan, the, what the Supreme Court really said in Hamdan was common article three of the Geneva Conventions apply. This is in 2006. Common article three applies. And that the military commissions needed to be blessed by the Congress. The Congress wasn't doing its job. The Supreme Court had to step in and say, you know what? You need to bless these military commissions down in Guantanamo. Those are the two major takeaways from Hamdan that you would have on an exam, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But, but I think that, uh, what, what did the Congress do? They went back and they wrote the Military Commissions Act. So they did respond, but they didn't go arguably far enough, right? They went, the Congress responded and wrote the Military Commissions Act, which is the same things that Steve's complaining about today. The Congress didn't meet their needs to limit as far as maybe some might think, but they did respond in some way or some fashion. And again, I would just look on the last point with Boumidien, to look at that case, read that case, study that case, and recognize what I'm saying. There's two major issues there that we need to be considering, particularly in a time of armed conflict. One is there's something the Supreme Court jurisprudence, if you're studying constitutional law at all, something called the deference doctrine, military deference doctrine. What Boumidian said is any decision that a military member, the Army SEAL Marine, that seizes a person in the battlefield and puts them into the detention facility, wherever that be, in Bagram, Afghanistan, in Iraq, or in Gitmo, that they're not going to defer to it at all. There's no deference to the military decisions. The person that actually took the person, seized them, and imprisoned them is not involved, is not even any paper trail required. This is now a federal district court in Washington, a, sorry, a civilian court in Washington, makes that determination whether it's lawful or not in a period of armed conflict. And the second one is the idea about now giving Al-Qaeda-type warriors access to our federal court system with the whole penumbra of those constitutional protections that we all hold so dear that even our brothers or sisters or colleagues or fellow warriors in traditional nation states would never have access to. I don't think Justice Kennedy fully understood the ramifications of his decision or the majority of what it would mean to the United States, what it means to the United States military, and what it could mean for the United States society and constitution in the years to come. Thank you. Well, rebuttal time. I get to start where he ended. What it means. I think Justice Kennedy understood precisely what it means. I think Justice Kennedy understood that what we have been doing in Guantanamo by creating a lawless situation creates extreme danger to all the men and the women in this country, such as Glenn, who are wearing a uniform and fighting on our behalf overseas. I learned that in Sudan when I was meeting with the ministers of that country. And a former minister said to me as follows, we understand the war in Iraq, Steve. Your country's imperialistic, there's oil there, so your country went in. He said, we can't understand Guantanamo. If your country, which is supposed to be the beacon of liberty, ignores the Geneva Conventions, ignores the rule of law. Imagine the license that that gives to countries such as mine and leaders such as exist in the Sudan. The rule of law, that's what Justice Kennedy was writing about, not just for the men whose cases were before him, but for every United States citizen wearing a uniform who may get picked up in Afghanistan, Iraq, China, Iran, or wherever in the world, we may send our forces. If we don't uphold the rule of law, we cannot expect the others to do so. Now, the argument that the men of, of Al-Qaeda have more rights than others, with all respect, Glenn, that's not what Boumedian is about. When you read Boumedian, when you read what the Supreme Court was responding to, you see that they were responding to a horrible mess that the Bush administration created with Congress acquiescence to a certain extent by ignoring the rule of law. You need to go back to the fall of 2001. 
memos. Now, I didn't sit in the White House and I didn't sit in the Vice President's office, but I sure have had access to all the legal memos written by the Office of White House Counsel, Legal Counsel, then Alberto Gonzalez, eventually Attorney General, then removed from that position. From the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, now Federal Judge Bybee, now Professor at Berkeley, Mr. Wu, Addington in Cheney's office. They wrote memos that said that we will declare the Taliban a failed state. Huh? Why does that, what's that mean? Why is that relevant? If Afghanistan were viewed as having a legitimate government, when our forces went in, the soldiers for the Afghan government, including allied soldiers perhaps, such as Al-Qaeda fighters, who might not have been officially part of the Afghan government, would have been entitled to the protections of the Geneva Convention. Visitation, communication with other people, a number of things that we want our soldiers to have when they're picked up. They said, we can avoid that. We can put these men into a no man's land of law if we declare the Taliban a failed state. And on February 7, 2002, President Bush signed a declaration declaring the Taliban a failed state, thereby, as a matter of law as they saw, taking these men outside the protections of the Geneva Conventions. Second, as I said in my opening remarks, what Justice Kennedy and the majority were responding to was the fact that in June of 2008, these men had been sitting in Guantanamo with no meaningful process for six years. The court said, that's not okay. Whether you call this a war or a law enforcement action, you can't do that. Too much time has gone by, Mr. President. You blew it. Of course, he didn't use that phrase. But that's what he said. You've created a mess. You violated the law. And we're going to have to do something to try to extricate us from that mess. Then they said, let's look at the process you did create in 2004 after our first decision when we said, you know, you've held people there for two years and you did absolutely nothing, then you created a process. What you created, he said, for the majority, was a sham. Hence the title of my book, Cop Who Comes to America. Because when I got into these cases and read the process and saw what was happening in Guantanamo, I said, somebody read Cop his book, The Trial in College, as I did here at Colgate. And somebody thought, wow, that's a cool system. Let's in create it in the real world and install it in Guantanamo. We won't show them the charges. We won't let them produce any meaningful evidence. We'll give them something called a personal representative who is not, by our rules, allowed to advocate for them. And the Supreme Court said, no, that is not a meaningful process. That's a sham. So we're going to have to have some sort of process. And all we can trust at this point is the federal judiciary. And the most important response to what Glenn says about, oh, there are more rights, and look at what we have set up for these men in Al-Qaeda, is this. Many of the men in Guantanamo, including a fair number of my clients, were not picked up on the battlefield. I hate to use the phrase, but I'm going to. The big lie. In history, that comes from Nazi Germany. In America, Take a look at what the President, Vice President, and Secretary of Defense have said repeatedly. What was said even at presidential conventions as recently as this summer. Every man in Guantanamo was picked up on a battlefield. Every man in Guantanamo is a hardened Al-Qaeda fighter. That is plainly and simply untrue. And you can look it up. The military's own data available to each and every one of you online shows that fewer than 5%, fewer than 5%, one out of 20, were actually picked up on a battlefield. That's part of what the Supreme Court was responding to. 
There is a tremendous difference in terms of the application of Boumediene and what they were talking about. Because they specifically said, we're addressing a situation of men who are in a prison, nowhere near a battlefield, men who have been in a prison for six years, many of whom tell us that they were not soldiers, Al-Qaeda fighters, Al-Qaeda supporters, and when the military's own data shows, they weren't on a battlefield. Now, those men who were picked up on a battlefield will not get any habeas corpus rights. Any. That's not what Boumediene says. With all respect, I say that's a straw man argument. Those who are in Guantanamo, for whom Boumediene's habeas rights apply, are in an entirely different category than those people who may be picked up on a battlefield tomorrow. That's part of the reality that we're dealing with here. One other aspect in terms of lawlessness and what the White House has done. The authorization for enhanced interrogation techniques, torture, call it what you will, comes directly from the leaders of the administration. You can find Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld's specific personal approval. And then you can read the FBI and the military interrogators, the professional interrogators, saying that's unwise because they can do it to us. It's unwise because it gets unreliable information. But they went forward and did it anyway. We have what is called the War Crimes Act, Title 18, Section 2441. You torture people, you violate the Geneva Conventions, it's a crime. Again, failed state, Geneva doesn't apply, redefine torture, and oh, by the way, in the Military Commissions Act, let's put in an immunity clause by redefining torture all the way back to 1997. So that the President, Vice President, Secretary of Defense, and all of the generals who have specifically approved this treatment cannot be prosecuted. And I ask you this way, whether legal, maybe, constitutional, maybe, is that a moral or ethical thing to do? At this time, I, I mean, you did pose a question to him, and that was the final element of the format. Would you like to pose one question to him, or should we turn to questions from the audience. Mine can be viewed as rhetorical, if you'd like it to be. <laughs> I'm against torture, if that helps. <laughs> okay, in, in the spirit of Professor Brubaker, who once again, I regret that he's not here, he says, with regard to questions from the audience, we should always begin with three students' questions before we turn to professors who tend to give longer questions. So, three student questions, and then, and then a professor question, yes. Um, you want to address it to a specific matter? Um, I think most of us can concede that the president and the executive have never stuck his bounds in Guantanamo. But I will kind of raise the question that Chief Justice Roberts raises in his dissent in Dominion, which is what grounds are there to extending the right of these combatants to giving them access to the federal court? Where, where's the precedent? Precedent for that is set out in Justice Kennedy's opinion, probably covering roughly 20 pages of the opinion. The right of habeas historically has been available to citizens and aliens. Long before September 11, my office was involved in hundreds of representations of people who had been put into custody by what was then the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And uh, one of our cases ended up reaching the Supreme Court, Supreme Court 7 to 2, uh, agreeing that those people had the right to petition for habeas and that what the government was doing to them was not lawful. The extraterritorial question uh, does habeas exist outside of U.S. territory? That's a little bit more difficult. The Boumediene decision, as did the Rasul decision, spent a great deal of time looking at the unique relationship between the United States and what Castro calls 
the sovereign land of Cuba that we have had a naval station in since the Spanish-American War. Uh, and as a re result of the specific language of the treaties and the way in which the law has been, U.S. law has been applied there, they concluded that the law, the U.S. Constitution is applicable in Guantanamo. It is not clear from Boumediene that they would reach the same result with respect to a person sitting in the Bagram Air Base who says, hey, I've been sitting in Bagram prison for six years and uh, I want access to the federal court. I don't believe that's clear in Boumediene because there is such a focus on the Cuban-American treaties and relationship. What, one, if I could, uh, but you'll certainly argue that in, uh, when it comes before your court, you'll be trying to apply that to those 20,000 prisoners in, in Bagram, right? If it comes before you, certainly it would be malpractice if you didn't argue that. Well, Glenn, that is uh, probably true that I would make that <laughs> argument. I do not know as I sit here today whether I would feel as confident uh, in the outcome as uh, I have been with respect to uh, the Guantanamo situation. No, no question. I think the door has been opened. Another question from the students? Yes. Uh, this is to Glenn. Um, would you consider the Korean War a war? No question. Yes. Yes? Yes. Um, I guess in that case, would if members uh, taken from North Korea, from the North Korean army, were taken to some station in Cuba, would they be warranted, uh, would they be considered enemy combatants and not warranted habeas corpus? No, they would be prisoners of war and they would be given prisoner of war status. It's a legitimate traditional armed conflict and as such they would be given the same rights and privileges of a, uh, a prisoner of war. Yeah, you, you need to understand the prisoner of war under the Geneva Conventions would not have a right to habeas because under the Geneva Conventions the authority of the parties to the war to seize and detain, imprison the members of the opposing forces is spelled out and is an accepted aspect of the international laws of war. I mean, part of the, the problem that, that we have in any discussion about Guantanamo is the somewhat unclear application of the laws of war. I mean, there's a treatise written by a fellow named Winthrop in 1920, which, which is still you know, the Bible for the laws of war. Very unusual to have something that old still being uh, you know, su such a fundamental you know, thing. We have our Supreme Court recognizing in limited circumstances the applicability of some of the international legal norms. That's part of the, the debate that exists within the court itself. Uh, but a prisoner of war status is accepted and there would be no habeas. It doesn't become an issue until you take people out of that process and create the type of situation that we have created. If I could just follow up, sure. I think uh, Stephen's right on target, and I, I think your question is great because that really goes to the issue we're we're talking about uh, and how it does become unclear and often ambiguous. But it's important if you study the Geneva Conventions at all, the real issue is to provide reciprocity to one another. And why this becomes even more problematic is to provide the sovereigns make the decisions to go to war. President Bush says we go to war, the U.S. Armed Forces goes to war. We're not, we don't have any say. We're just the ordinary Jamokes doing it. Chinese, the Iraqi soldiers, or the say the Chinese, God forbid, or whomever, are friends. It's not them making the decisions, it's the sovereign makes the decisions. And the Geneva Conventions, in Article 3 we're talking about, of the Geneva Conventions, this prisoner of war status, is to give people the recognition that they are purely carrying out the will of the sovereign. Reciprocity, that they're treated with dignity and respect, that they're not there just murdering people, they're carrying out conduct that's really, in many ways, inhumane, but they're being asked to do that by their governments, and will treat each other the same becomes even more difficult to apply it in this case because we have a no nation state. Al-Qaeda didn't sign, wasn't around when the Geneva Conventions were drafted or the protocols. Uh, 
They don't represent a nation state. There's nobody to negotiate with. And they are citizens from 50 nations. And they flout these. There's no chance of reciprocity when we're captured on the battlefield or we're captured or CIA members uh, captured by Al Qaeda. There's no chance for reciprocity. So it makes it even more complex, if that makes sense to you, than, than the standard uh, Korean War analysis or even the, the German prisoners of war with the United States during, uh, or, or the Japanese. There's certainly people who can still violate those provisions like the Japanese did. I think American POWs in the Second World War, 40% only returned. 40% of American POW. Yeah, I, what I think, Glenn, is that what we're talking about right now, as I'm hearing it, may be the area where we see the world most differently. Just there? Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I say that for this reason. My response to this, you know, the, the notion that this is different, there is no reciprocity is I just don't trust President Bush, President Clinton, President anybody to make sound decisions about whether or not people are members of Al-Qaeda or any other terrorist group. And I say that based on my general worldview, family history and, and, and things of that nature, but also my personal experience of representing people who have been mistakenly and falsely accused. I mean, what I see is that the, the high and mighty language in the Federalist Papers comes down to the fact that fear is a tremendous motivating factor. And I think that, why doesn't Congress check Bush? Fear. Their fear, our fear as citizens, combination of the two. But when people act out of fear, it seems to me they lose perspective. They lose judgment. And what then happens is you go into somebody's home in his apartment in Peshawar, Pakistan, where he's just come home from work, where he has been a hospital administrator delivering United States food products to Afghan uh, you know, people in, in a civilian hospital. And because you have faulty intelligence and you have geopolitical you know, fat forces at work, you make a mistake. And if you then say, we are outside any notion of the rule of law, you have innocent men who are sitting in prison, which at the end of the day, as I see it, imperils all of us. Because the argument is made, we can do this in p to people picked up in Peshawar, but we can also do it to Padilla, who was picked up at the airport in Chicago. And if you can do it to Padilla, if you can do it to my client, Brandon Mayfield, because they put into his search warrant affidavit, yes, there's a fingerprint identification, but we're picking him up because he's a Muslim, because he's been observed going into a mosque, because he's married to an Egyptian, because he has a client who holds anti-American and anti-Semitic views. That was in the paperwork submitted to the federal court to support his arrest. If you can do that, none of us are safe, and I just don't trust any governmental leader to act outside the law without the checks and balances of the others. And, I, and my guess is, what I'm sort of hearing is, you have more trust in the leadership than I do. I think it's more than trust. I think you do have the checks um, in place. And, and again, we do have, you should all take pleasure if you think that the president has been excessive, that the Supreme Court has checked in. You may disagree, I do. I think it's not their role. I think, but the reason why they're having to do that is because of the inefficiencies, again, of our Congress. And perhaps we need to really look at that as being an institution. Again, we we're talking about this the whole time. What we have really, with your checks and balances, stuff that you had in high school civics and you're taking now, what really we're, we're seeing is a bureaucratic inefficiency to do with their intended purposes. The Congress. Naturally, all, we know the ambition counters ambition, words that are key to us right now in college, right? is the ambition counters ambition. What's happening is President, President Reagan, President Bush, President Clinton, President Bush all seek to what? Gain, it's natural for an executive to want more and more power. And we're seeing it growing more. I think our real concern should be institutionally, from an institutional perspective of what's happening. And we're seeing more and more presidents getting more and more executive power while the Congress sits and the Congress campaigns and every two years has to reelect themselves.
Question here? Yeah. Uh, for Attorney Lax, if you are going to use Article 3 courts, what sort of evidentiary procedures and um, standards should you be using then if you are going to be having these military personnel kind of gather this intelligence and make these arrests? Where do you kind of draw the distinction? Because it does sort of sound like then you do a hybrid of systems. I have to give you two different levels of or tracks of response. Mr. Rassam, the alleged uh, Millennium Bomber, uh, charged in the federal court in the normal course, convicted, sentenced to 20 some years in prison. Masawi, 9-11 yeah. bomber, hijacker, charged in federal court, convicted, sentenced to uh, you know, life in prison. It seems to me that our system is strong in many respects. That all the weaknesses that we, you know, we talk about, at the end of the day, We've got an incredibly resilient system, and we have an independent judiciary that, as I see it, has been eminently capable of prosecuting and convicting terrorists on standard evidence, standard issues of proof. Now, in Boumediene, with respect to the habeas process that is due to the men in Guantanamo, at the end of his opinion, Justice Kennedy punted, and he said, we're not saying here precisely what that process is. So, decision comes down on June 12, 2008. June 13, the battle began. And over the course of the summer, the habeas lawyers, uh, people who are uh, volunteering their time in, in large law firms and in federal defender offices around the country, uh, have been filing petitions and pleadings saying, these guys are entitled to lots of process. And the Department of Justice lawyers have been coming in and saying they're entitled to very little process. And the judges on the court in Washington, D.C. have been sitting there going, oh, God, we don't know what to do yet. My prediction is 2010, we're back in the Supreme Court, and they'll tell us just how much process is due. And what we are going to get, I predict, is something that is less than the full panoply of rights that exist in a habeas case today, which is far less than the rights that are available in a criminal trial. It may be that it ends up somewhat akin to what Glenn might be promoting in terms of these national security courts. I don't believe we should go to a national security court because I think that we then start further down the road of secrecy and the dangers of secrecy I view as extreme. I think our federal court system can handle it. I have a security clearance, and in a case in which I'm involved right now, I expect it's going to be upgraded to a top secret clearance, and if need be, I can get a compartmentalized skiff secret clearance as a defense attorney. The courts can do it. We can do it in the light of day in the regular federal court. The process is going to be somewhat less than is normal in habeas. I see that as inevitable. Of course, I'm fighting and arguing for a lot of process. Ain't going to get it. Rejoinder, and then maybe two more questions. Just quickly, I think in 2010, we will have these special terrorist courts. It might help. Um, it's my hope. Well, but if I, your book sells well, <laughs> we probably will. These guys buy it. I'll be back here in six months, guys. Real quickly, the other one is uh, of note, um, Neil Katchel, who's a good friend of mine and a Georgetown University law professor who represented Hamdan, because of the concerns you're raising, one of the folks that defended Hamdan before the Supreme Court is embracing the national security court idea as well because of his concerns of the slippery slope of our own rights. You just heard uh, Attorney Wax say that there would be a little reduction maybe of the habeas. Well, gosh, I don't want that. I want our system to stay intact. I want all of us to have all the panoply of constitutional protections. I don't want us to run the risk of having eroding what is precious to all of us is our constitutional rights. A special court would limit that to just these cases. Two more questions, a professor question. You want to cede your question, Professor Burns, to the student? I haven't. Oh, I thought you were going to have a question. Oh, I thought you were going to have a question. No, sir. Okay. Uh, Andrew? Um, this is addressing both panelists. Um, perhaps uh, Mr. Wax wants to go first. A little louder, please. This is addressing both panelists. Perhaps Mr. Wax wants to go first because he brought it up. Um, with regards to uh, a battlefield, um, obviously we're dealing with a transnational terrorist organization. How do, how have courts up to this point defined a battlefield? 
Um, obviously, we've been attacked at home. We have a, we've been Europeans have been attacked in multiple countries. Um, they attack Muslim countries as well. Um, obviously, every, almost every day. Um, how do you define battlefield? I think that when you focus on individual acts of terror, such as the Madrid train bombings, the English subway bombings, the World Trade Center bombings, that in those types of situations, the question should not be, how do you define a battlefield? To me, those are the cases that are easiest and most clearly brought within the traditional criminal justice system. The Spanish prosecuted the Moroccans and Algerians who did the bombings in Madrid. The English prosecuted. We prosecuted Massawi because he, he lived. It seems to me that the military paradigm is inapplicable to those individual acts of terror. We have been prosecuting the funders of those acts. And one of my current clients is a person who is charged with uh, providing money. And you can get beyond the individual actors through the traditional law of conspiracy. The battlefield. If you look at Iraq or at Afghanistan, it seems to me that's where the notion of the battlefield is most applicable. If you pick somebody up while he's fighting, out of uniform, the traditional laws of war distinguish between people who are in uniform and who are out of uniform. Use them. The German spies who were picked up on Long Island, out of uniform, prosecuted and executed pretty bloody quickly. By a military commission, though, Steve. Yes, by a military commission, you know, un under the, the, the laws of war. So I, I think that the administration made a tremendous mistake through its hyperbole, exaggeration, or out-and-out -out lies, however you want to characterize it, by saying all these guys came from the battlefield. They did it. And when you pick someone up in his home, whether it's in Bosnia, where some of the men were picked up, whether it's in <coughs> Pakistan, you know, a year after the hostilities ended in Afghanistan, if you've got evidence for those men, it's a finite number, charge them, prosecute them, and imprison them. Or if you believe in the death penalty and they've done something bad enough, I don't believe in this, but execute them. I think the system works. And to get into a debate about what is or is not a battlefield in this new type of war is a distraction from what I think is the, a more reasonable method of analysis. I'll be quick because and people probably still have questions. Um, I do think that was something that I wanted to ask as well. Is when you say something like that, what we just set up was a bifurcated process potentially, where someone who's on a traditional battlefield in Afghanistan and Iraq goes to military commission, and we have someone who might be in Yemen who's an Al Qaeda operative sending signals or sending operational plans to start a target in the United States, and we'd say, okay, well, the fellow on the battlefield goes to military commission. And this fellow goes to our federal courts. Again, the need for something to make it clear and in one place would be the terrorist court, where they all go to there. It's clear. If they're acting in that, on behalf of international terrorism, they would have one place and one venue to try them, rather than having to worry about this very difficult issue. And I think uh, what I, we refer to, and I do believe this, is a little bit, if you start saying the civilian court system is the way to go and, and trumpeting that, you go back to the September 10th mentality. And it's easy to forget what it was like beforehand, right? Most of you were quite young on September the 11th. And don't quote me on the September 10th menta mentality. It's not hyperbole. It's not something. Who used that? Just read the 9-11 Commission. Page <laughs> 177. Specifically spells out the concerns to not go back to that mentality, the bipartisan 9-11 Commission. So I think we have to just remember um, to think about this as some sort of an armed conflict. Different, unique, but not go back to that 9-10 mentality. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I think yeah. Uh, one of the most interesting issues today is that the security threats that we face are not actually on a battlefield, as you said, but it might be five guys in a computer with the internet in a, some apartment in Yemen someplace. 
And I think what that forces us to do is rely on intelligence more than we had before. And I think intelligence is imperfect by its, by its own nature. Uh, but I think at some point, in order to rely on that and still make security progress, there has to be some sort of reduction in civil liberties during the conflict that we face. Would, would you see, at least Mr. Wax, that, that while using a federal court system is obviously the ideal scenario, that it, it might, given what we have now, just be a logistical possibility in, for all cases? A logistical impossibility for all cases. I mean, I've been taught never to say never or never to say always. So I, I think that the question you're asking is one that points out problems that we have. What I worry about, what I have seen, is that not only is intelligence imperfect, but our reliance on, for example, the Pakistani intelligence services was entirely politically motivated. President Bush said to Musharraf in 2001, you're with us or you're against us? Musharraf said, okay, I'm with you. Musharraf said to the Pakistani intelligence services, we're with him. We need to provide people to the U.S. The Pakistani intelligence services primary ethnic origin is Pashtun. Pashtuns cross the Afghan-Pakistan border. The Taliban are primarily Pashtun. Many of the Pakistani intelligence services people are supporters of the Taliban. They would not turn in their own people. But when the Pakistani intelligence people acted at Musharraf's behest, among other things, they did something as racist as we're accused of doing in Guantanamo. They rounded up the Arabs. Arabs are the other, among other others, in Pakistan. They rounded up the Arabs. My client is one of those rounded up. So I think that if we're going to talk about practical realities, we have to recognize that there, is, there are geopolitical forces that none of us probably understand fully, there is also out-and-out out corruption. A fair number of the men in Guantanamo were literally sold for bounties of $5,000. Greed, lust, all of the traditional of the seven, seven deadly sins you know, are at play here. Which gets back, for me, to the fact that I don't trust men I tr or women. I trust law the rule of law. And I think that Glenn's proposal for the national security courts is far better than what we have had in Guantanamo because it is a legal process. That's what I want. And when I went down to Guantanamo for the first time, I had no clue if I was representing innocent or guilty men. And in many respects, it didn't matter because I was fighting for the rule of law. Give them process. Give them some process. Finally, I hope it's happening. And interesting to note, Hamdan went through a military conviction, a military commission. He was convicted. He was acquitted of the conspiracy charge. The military guy is saying, this is nuts. The guy's a driver. I've got a driver. My driver doesn't conspire with me. We don't believe that he conspired with bin Laden. We do believe that he was providing support. And then they sentenced him to five and a half years in prison. And they said that uh, anything you know, beyond that, you know, it, it's like hitting a, a, a fly with a grenade, I think one of the jurors was quoted as saying. You know, there's a system, flawed as it is, it worked. You know, thank God, six years down the road. Thank you. Glenn and I have to go eat. <laughs> and then I'm giving another talk yeah. at 8 o'clock. I and Glenn can come if he wants, and you can ask me all the fiery questions you want, because <laughs> uh, you ain't seen nothing yet in terms Lawrence of the passion. 105 <laughs> for a session on his book. Thank you very much. We should do it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your book comes yeah, we should. Yeah. 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 Yeah.